is Pastor Ken, and this evening we're going to start a new series, and this is on the armor of God, and so this is going to be in Ephesians chapter 6, and so we will get let you get your tools ready. Uh, if you want to see the notes, click on the section below that says notes. If you want to fill in the notes as we move through the lesson, then uh, go in, sign in with Facebook, come back here, and I'll be right here waiting for you. So, let's get ready. Get your Bible, get your lesson, and get a pen, get your notebook, get everything that you're going to need for tonight's lesson. Amen. Our lesson begins in chapter uh, 6 of Ephesians, and we're looking at... Uh, Paul writing to the church at Ephesus. Now, as we move through this lesson, there are some important things that we're going to keep in mind. Uh, Paul tells us right off the bat, put on the whole armor of God. And that's in verse number 10. We'll read uh, more of the verses in just a moment. But, you know, we're going to ask these sort of rhetorical questions. What is armor? Da. Everyone knows what armor is. Now, armor certainly has changed over the years, hasn't it? If we were thinking about in Bible days, their, their helmets and uh, breastplates and things would have been made out of crude metals. Uh, today, we're looking at Kevlar body armor, okay, and, and helmets that are uh, also made with Kevlar, Kevlar uh, re reinforcements. And uh, so totally different way that we uh, wage war today. And so we're looking at the armor and we're seeing how do we put it on, when do we put it on, and so we asked ourselves this big question, is it relevant for today? And of course you know this, the answer is obviously it is relevant for today. In fact, Paul says that we are weak and we are afflicted and we're in uh, distress because we don't put on the armor of God, and we don't, we're not able to stand, and we fall down, and we make mistakes. And so Paul is telling us, put on this whole armor of God. Now, in Ephesians chapter 1, we read, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to God's holy people in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul is the author of Ephesians. Now we first read about Paul persecuting the church in Acts chapter 9. You remember this, Acts chapter 9 beginning at verse number 1. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. And so there's where we first read about Saul. Now, we do know that since the beginning of Acts 9-1, Paul has been through many troubles. And we read about them in 2 Corinthians 11 chapter 11, verse 24 through 28. I want to read these things to you so you see what the Apostle Paul has been through. He says, Five times I received from the Jews the forty lashes minus one, or thirty-nine stripes. And that's just what Jesus bore on his back when he was crucified. So Paul five times was uh, whipped. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I have been constantly on the move. I have been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false believers. I have labored and toiled, and I have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst, and have often gone without food. 
I have been cold and naked. And then, after all these physical maladies that he has been through, he says that this, besides everything else, I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. Now, I want you to see how important it was the churches and their welfare to Paul. Paul is likening the effect that he has of the concern for the churches on him. He likens it to this physical abuse that he went through. Now, if you have ever cared for a loved one that's been uh, in distress or hurt or wounded, you know exactly what Paul is talking about. Now, on top of this, we find out that Paul is writing this book, the book of Ephesians. He's writing this from a prison in Rome. And that's in at Romans, uh, Ephesians chapter 6, verse number 20. And we're going to read more of those verses in just a moment. So I want you to see the picture. Paul is in a jail, in prison, in Rome. Uh, and as he is being guarded by uh, four soldiers at a time, and they change shifts regularly. And Paul is looking at the, the armor that a soldier is wearing, and he is going to point out to us some of the things that we need to do as uh, warriors for Jesus. And so he likens the armor of a Roman soldier to the armor of God that we need to put on. So I want you to keep that in mind, the picture of a Roman soldier, as we move through tonight's lesson. Question number three, and uh, to help us along in this, uh, we need God's armor because, and here are some of the things why we need that armor of God. Remember what I led, read just a moment ago that Paul had gone through, all of these things that he had suffered physically in 2 Corinthians 11. He also says this in 2 Corinthians 4, verses 8 and 9. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. We are persecuted, but not abandoned. We are struck down, but not destroyed. And so we take all of these things together and we see all of the maladies and all the problems and situations that Paul has gone through. We reckon ourselves to have gone through similar things that, you know, you can say today that we can be and we are hard pressed on every side, you know, everywhere you go uh, with this pandemic that's going on, uh, you're, you're the what you have to do and what you can't do and, you know, cleaning and trying to get supplies and shopping and wearing masks and washing your hands again. Uh, and it feels like you've got someone looking over your shoulder all the time. On top of that, there are people that are ready to, if you don't do exactly what they say, they're ready to pick up the phone and, and rat on you. We are perplexed but we're not in despair. We are persecuted, but we are not abandoned. We may be struck down. We may lose, but we are not destroyed. And so how do we manage this? How do we get pressed, but not crushed? How are we perplexed and not in despair? How are we persecuted, but not abandoned? How are we struck down, but not destroyed? We do that by putting on the armor of God. Now, Question number four, what is the armor of God? Well, the armor of God is a metaphor for preparation that we need to take. So as we are, you know, getting ready to do battle every day, there are some things that we need to do. Today we are, letter B, we are fighting a spiritual enemy. Even if you are, even if you're dealing with somebody and if you go back to question number three, and even if you're dealing with someone that's pressing you hard on every side, 
even if you're dealing with something that's perplexing and you can't get your mind around it, even if you're persecuted for Jesus Christ, even if you're struck down, in all of these things, even though there may be a physical person that is giving you uh, a time, behind that, we are fighting a spiritual enemy. And our enemy is not flesh and blood, no human foe. The devil himself and his imps are behind all of these situations. So what can we do in the face of such overwhelming odds? Is there any hope? Well, if you go back to question number three and on the left-hand side where it says we are and then but we are not, on, those, on that left-hand side, that may be uh, the situation, the problem. That might be what we think are the overwhelming odds. But on the right is the hope. So we are pressed, but not crushed. You know, it, we need to see the silver lining. We need to see that it could be worse if it hadn't been for the Lord. And so Paul admonishes the church at Ephesus, even though he himself is going through a terrible time under arrest, and he tells them, put on all of God's armor and you will be able to stand. We need to have all of it. You cannot leave off any piece of God's armor. Just like the soldier who's getting ready for work, you know, to do his job, to guard Paul, you have to put on the whole armor of God and don't take it off for one instant. Now, I want you to see how that in the Old Testament, Isaiah prophesies how that Jesus would be the fulfillment of this armor of God. Look in Isaiah 59 with me and verse number 17. It says, the Lord looked and was displeased that there was no justice. Hmm, doesn't that sound like a little bit of stuff that's going on today? Do you think that the Lord today is pleased with injustices that are happening? Now, it doesn't matter where the injustice is. It may be in your house. It may be halfway around the world. But wherever there is injustice, know this today. The Lord is not in favor of that. He does not approve of it. And know that you cannot cheat God. You cannot be dishonest. It will come back and God will honor you. God will take care of you. God will take care of the right. And so he says here today, he was displeased about no justice. He saw that there was no one. He was appalled that there was no one to intervene. So his arm achieved salvation for him and his own righteousness sustained him. He put on righteousness as his breastplate the helmet of salvation on his head. He put on the garments of vengeance and wrapped himself in zeal as in a cloak. And so we see that this is what the Lord Jesus did when he came to earth. He wrapped himself in righteousness. So wherever he went, whatever he did, whatever he said, every situation he conducted himself, you know, we have the expression today, what would Jesus do? Jesus always did the right thing. So there's that righteousness that Jesus performed when he was here on earth. The helmet of salvation. And he had that firmly on his head and he spoke it and he prof prophetically proclaimed the salvation of the Lord and the knowledge of the Lord. He put on the garments of praise for clothing. He was clad with zeal as a cloak. So we certainly have seen these characteristics in the life of Jesus as he moved through and among the people of God. Now let's look at Romans chapter 13 in question number 6. In Romans 13 verses 11 to 14. 
15, do this, understanding the present time. Now, every generation needs to understand their, their present time. What are we going through? And get ready, because he says, the hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave decently as in the daytime, not carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. So these things that Paul talks about negatively, we could not imagine Jesus being involved in them. And so we want to do just the opposite, put on the hour of of light. He says to them in question number six, the hour has come for you to wake up. Wake up from your sleep. Now is the time to wake up. Our salvation is nearer than we first believed. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. Put aside the deeds of darkness. Let us put on the armor of light. And let us behave decently, not walking in sin. And clothe, clothe yourself with Jesus not gratifying the flesh. Well, you know, if we just did these things on a daily basis every single day, we wouldn't have to worry too much about other things, would we? Worry about us. Take care of us. I can't help what people are doing out there, over there, in there, around there. I need to do the right thing in my life. And question number seven Paul continues this analogy of putting on the whole armor of God. And so we're going to look at 2 Corinthians chapter 10. So if you want to open your Bible, flip over to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. I love this chapter, chapter 10. It gives us, this is a very strong chapter and powerful. And, and we need to really grasp what this really is saying to us. Beginning at verse number three. For though we live in the world, we do not wage world war as the world does. Okay? How does the world wage war? Now, looking at that soldier, yes, you know, he fights, he has a sword, spear, spear bow, arrows, all that stuff. And, you know, today, how does the world wage war? And, you know, the war is terrible, okay? And the weapons of war are horrible and horrific. Uh, but he's also bringing this closer to home. How in the world, how, does the, how do people in the world, uh, how do they live eat against each other and wage war against each other? And so he says, though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. In other words... When someone does something mean and nasty to us, we do not do mean and nasty to them. If someone hurts us, we do not hurt back. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. So though we're living in the world, we should not stoop to their level. He says the weapons, with verse number four, the weapons we fight with are not weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. So the weapons that we have are special. They're more powerful than any weapon on the face of the earth that man can come up with. We demolish every argument and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ, and we will be ready to punish every act of disobedience once your obedience is complete. In other words, you don't have to wait for somebody to, to punish you if you have messed up. The punishment you have, you know that you've messed up, okay? And you need to come and make that right 
to the Lord. And so any thought that's contrary to what God has for us, there's what we need to grab a hold of it and surrender it to the Lord. In Romans chapter 8, we're moving right along, verses 37 to 39. He says, no, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so Paul reveals the protecting power of of Jesus Christ. He shows us right here what the armor of God is able to do. If we stand in the love of God, we will we effectively wear wage war when we wear the armor. And again, we're not waging it the way that the world wages armor, but we take each piece of the armor of God and we use it the way God intended. Every instrument, every weapon has a plan, it has a purpose, has a, has a way that it is supposed to be used. It reminds me of someone who was uh, using a hammer to put screws in a door hinge. And they would hold up the screw and they would hit that and they would drive that screw into the wood. Someone was watching them and they said, you're using a hammer to put those screws in there? You, what do you think the head on that? What do you think the head on that screw is for? And the guy never even looked up. He said, "Oh, that's to take the screws out." <laughs> well, the the screws don't do their job uh, when they're driven in like that. They need to be uh, screwed in with a screwdriver. Uh, you need the right tool, the right time, and the right place. So, without the armor of God, we are powerless against the enemy. When you go back to the question that talked about being pressed and not crushed, perplexed but not in despair, persecuted but not abandoned, struck down but not destroyed. Well, you know, when I'm reading that verse and you say, well, pastor, I, I'm crushed or I'm in despair, I, I, you know, or I feel so, I am abandoned. No, oh, I am just wiped out. I am destroyed. Well, maybe the reason that you're in all of those situations, that you're crushed in despair and you feel abandoned and destroyed, is because you don't have the armor of God on. With the armor of God, without it we're powerless, but with it we are more than conquerors. What does that mean? It means that you and I don't have to lift a finger in order to defeat the enemy. He has already done it. We just need to pick up the armor, put on the armor of God on our spiritual man. Now, I told you we're going to look a little bit more at the armor. In Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 to 20, Paul says, and we're going to uh, walk through these verses, and the next few weeks we're going to talk about these individual pieces of armor, uh, but right now we're going to just fly right through them. Okay, you ready? Buckle your seatbelt. There's a day of evil coming. Da. When you leave tonight's lesson, you're going to say, Wow, I learned something tonight. Pastor Ken told me something I didn't know. There's an evil day coming. Well, you know, in the last few months you have probably seen some things that have been disturbing to you. In the last year, we've seen cities burning. We've, we've seen people doing horrible things and getting away with it, and just terrible. The evil day is here. Now, it's going to get worse, but right now, the evil is here. So you need to be careful for yourself. Put on the armor of God and be able to stand your ground. So... You know, you want to be able to stand. You don't want to fall down. You come to test and trial, you want to stand. You don't want to be knocked down. He says, have the belt of truth buckled around your waist. Now, we'll talk a little bit more about this, but that truth, you, 
You take the truth of God and you, and you buckle down. In other words, truth all the time, everywhere. So just as a belt, you know, that belt is a circle. You know, if, if, it, if you don't buckle it, it's going to fall down. It's not going to be able to hold up your sword. It's not going to hold up your pants. You're not going to hold it. It's, you're, you're going to be in trouble. And so you need that truth all the time. Put on the breastplate of righteousness in its place. Righteousness over your heart. You need it right up here. Here's where your vital organs are. You know, if you get shot here in this area, uh, you get an arrow, you get a, a dart, you get uh, a slingshot, you know, you get hit in that area and it's life-threatening. So keep the Lord's righteousness, not your righteousness. Prophet Jeremiah said that my righteousness is as filthy rags, but the Lord's righteousness is right all the time. Letter E, have your feet fitted with the readiness of the gospel of peace. In other words, everywhere you go, whether you're going forward, sideways, backwards, up, down, be ready for peace. You seek peace. Take up the shield of faith to extinguish extinguish flaming arrows. And so you put the shield on your arm and you brace it up there, put it up there to absorb the attacks of those flaming arrows. You know, in, in uh, Paul's day, uh, archers would take their arrows and dip them in oil and then light them. And uh, then they would shoot them. So if, if uh, your shield was made out of wood, that flaming arrow would go into the wood and catch it on fire. Or if your doors or your house was made out of wood, the arrow would catch your house on fire. And so he says that shield of faith, you put it up there, let the faith of the Lord extinguish the arrows. And those darts, they burn. You know, people, they'll say and do things. Put the shield of faith up there. Remembering they're not doing it against you. They're doing it against Jesus. Take the helmet of salvation, which comes from repentance. So you put that on that helmet of salvation, to repent, get right with God. If you're not right with God, then all of the other pieces of armor aren't going to do you very much good. So you have to put that on and put it in place and, you know, put the helmet on, put it on right, okay? Don't have it sloppy. Fasten it up there. Know what you're talking about. Then he says, take the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Now, this here is really important. The sword of the Spirit. I will tell you that from years and years of following the Lord and years and years of being a pastor, almost all the time, when I'm talking to someone and they have a problem, they have a situation, something's going on, there's a, they're dealing with something. I can tell you that almost all the time when they're sharing their burden with me, there's a passage of scripture. Sometimes it's only a phrase, but it will come to mind and, and that phrase or that passage of scripture comes to bear on what they have been going through. And so the word of the Lord is able to do that. So as we read God's word, as we learn God's word, the more we will know of him and that word will be like a voice behind us and it will be able to cut between right and wrong. It'll be able to cut between, you know, we feel like we gotta do something. Okay, we, we don't have to. The word of the Lord is able to sever that and he's able to show the truth. Question number 10, our last question tonight. Stand in the armor then, okay? So, put the armor on, stand. When soldiers are getting ready to go into a battle, to go do something, what do they do? 
They get dressed. They put on every, get everything all set. Tighten this, screw that on, sharpen this, put their ammunition in. They're getting all ready. And then they stand up. And they almost, you know, stand at attention. Yes, sir. They're ready to go. And then they get their marching orders and they go out either two by two or they go out as a group. Okay. But once they get the armor on, they're able to stand. If you don't have the armor on, you're you're not ready. You're not ready to go. Okay. You'll you kind of be like uh, you know the person that's just half dressed and half put together. You know and this is going to fall off and that's going to fall off. Okay. Stand in the armor of God. Put it on. And Paul says to pray in the Spirit with all kinds of prayers. So prayer, pray, 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 I'll pray for, you know, you, pray for others, pray as you've never prayed before, all kinds of other, their thanksgiving and prayers of supplication, prayer and for, you know, for food on the table, praying for medical bills to be paid, all kinds of prayers. You keep praying in the spirit with the, with the armor of God. And be alert and keep praying for God's people. That's what Paul says. I'm going to pray for you as you pray for me. And so be alert. See, the soldier, that soldier that's guarding Paul, and he's been watching them come in and out, and they all come in, and they're all ready, and they're on alert, okay? They're keeping a sharp eye out. They're going to listen. They're going to watch. Okay, you got to know what to do. And he says, keep praying for God's people. Well, I told you this is just the beginning. We're going to look at these individual pieces of armor over the next several weeks. And we trust that you will join us for the rest of this lesson on the armor of God. This is lesson number one. Lesson two, next week. Amen. Let us close in prayer. Father, we are thankful that you do not leave us defenseless. But Lord, you uh, have provided ample armor for us to be able to stand before you, to be able to stand before uh, life situations, that God, you will help us to be able to make it through everything that the world throws against us. So we pray, Lord, that your presence tonight will be very strong in your people, Help us as we are beginning this lesson, oh God, to keep an open mind. What do you have for me and how am I going to do it? Lord, keep your hand upon each one. Lord, as they go through this pandemic, strengthen them, encourage them. Lord, let them feel the prayers of God's people. We ask tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you tonight. We are so glad that you joined us. We trust to see you on Saturday at Saturday School. Amen. Take care.